for joining us today. My name is Diana Fox Carney and I'm delighted to be the host of this series. This is the final one in our Building Back Better Together series. Uh, and today we're addressing the issue of buildings uh, and how to finance the green building wave. Uh, this is something that came up in our first session. And so uh, before we get going with our great panelists that we have for you today, I'm gonna to pass over to Toby uh, you all know Toby uh, Heaps, uh, and he's going to introduce uh, the analysis that we did previously around green building. Thank you, Toby. Thanks, Diana. W welcome everybody to the uh, the fifth and the the finale of this this series on building back better together with Europe that we're uh, co-hosting together with the German Embassy in Canada. We've saved the the best for last, and when I say best, uh, I'm thinking about the potential for jobs and for economic juice um, with respect to greening buildings, both uh, on the new build front and on the, the massive opportunity for retrofitting buildings. So this is a huge opportunity. In the analysis that we did uh, this spring with Ralph, Tori, and Celine back, the uh, biggest part of the uh, green recovery was uh, definitely in the building sector across the entire economy. We were looking at something in the neighborhood of $300 billion Canadian to be invested to retrofit the majority of our commercial and our residential building stocks, so our homes and workplaces over the next 10 years. Large number. Also, we're looking at flowing from that approximately 3 million job years. So 3 million job years, $300 billion. This is where the economic mojo is on the green recovery and perhaps more so for Canada than any other country on the planet. Because what a lot of people don't appreciate about Canada is we are among the world's most prominent commercial landlords. Um, our large pension funds and some of our large private equity funds like Brookfield control uh, upwards of a trillion dollars of capital that are invested in real estate assets around the world. So if we can nail how you do the green retrofits and the green builds here in Canada, that we have a platform, ready-made platform to export these solutions around the world and to make our companies more competitive and to make other places more efficient and, and uh, allow people to be more comfortable and to save money on their on their heating bills. How will we know if we're, we're cracking this? Right now, we're definitely not cracking this nut. Um, we know because many of the new builds, almost all of the new builds going up are not net zero. We're building new buildings with, with gas fixtures and uh, it's really not part of the default option. We'll know that we're nailing the green building opportunity if three things are happening. New builds, commercial and, and homes are net zero. We're gonna hear about how to make that happen today. And we'll also know what's happening if the commercial retrofit opportunity, which is immense and has attractive paybacks, but has had, had some little financial plumbing issues. If we start to work those out and see that happen at scale to really harness the true opportunity and get rapid paybacks in many cases, uh, well under 10 years. With the residential, that's the, the, the biggest nut to crack. It's a 200 billion out of 300 billion. It's a huge, huge opportunity. And the only way we're gonna crack that nut is if we change the costs of retrofitting. We have to bring them down dramatically by more than 40%. And if we can figure out a way to make this big investment in a way that we can scale the solutions, modulize the solutions, and make the solutions for insulating homes, for electrifying homes, and, and doing the other things for deep retrofits and more climate resilience, if we can make that cheap and affordable, it will scale. And there are many people who believe, including Ralph Torrey, that we could bring these costs down dramatically. And we're gonna hear about some solutions about how we could do that. Because if we can crack that nut, we are gonna open up a massive spigot of jobs uh, which will make the green recovery uh, one of the most popular things uh, governments have ever done. So without further ado, uh, I'll, I'll uh, pass it over to our co-host for this series, um, Ambassador Sparwasser. Uh, it's my honor, um, Ambassador. Thank you so much, Toby. And I can only echo what you've just said. Most of the times governments um, have only difficult options to choose from. We always have to weigh the different values and interests against each other's. If you take the pandemic, it's safety regulation against freedom or preserving health against keeping business open. But once in a while, in a while and rarely, you have um, actually a chance to adopt policies that offer only wins. And today, I think we're going to look at something like that. The retrofitting of buildings offers win, win, win. So allow me just to take a very quick look at Germany. 20% of our CO2 is produced by buildings. Enormous amount of greenhouse gases for older buildings, up to 80% of their consumption can be saved 
by outfitting them with modern technologies. So retrofitting has become a very important part of our German climate strategy. And the EU too has asked, asked all member states to produce uh, similar plans. Even better, we're confident, as Toby also has said, that the retrofitting program can create over 200,000 jobs in Germany over the next decades. And these are the jobs so badly needed to get us out of the present recession. And everybody else will benefit. Homeowners will be helped with credits for their investments, renters save on heating bills, families stay nice and warm. So I look really forward to hearing more about what this win-win-win policy may mean for Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you again for, for uh, sponsoring this series. So things are looking good, win-win-win. Let's hear about that and let's hear, you know, given that, why is it not happening and what can we do to overcome that? I want to start this week in Germany um, since, well, you may not know what is going on in Canada. I think most people almost certainly will not know what's going on in Germany. So let's get an introduction with, from Sabrina Schultz. Some of you may remember Sabrina was on our first uh, webinar in this series um, on financing the recovery. Uh, she's a policy fellow at Das Progressive Centrum in Berlin, and she was previously head of KFW's Berlin office. Sabrina, tell us a little bit about what your organizations are doing in this space and also what Germany is doing in the space. Thanks very much for the introduction. Now, um, the <laughs> the fact that I'm here as a policy fellow of the Progressive Center today is um, because I just left KFW, so I'm still speaking with all my KFW uh, knowledge in my head and uh, working for a policy um, think tank um, as a volunteer, actually, so that's not a paid-for job. Um, so, But in this context, uh, let me just give you a little bit of context. The ambassador, um, thank you very much, uh, you have already um, drawn a positive picture about Germany and the measures that are in place, the policies that are being pursued. Um, however, I just uh, need to dig a bit deeper. So retrofitting is not part of the economic recovery program, but there are lots of measures in place already in the context of um, climate and energy policy. And the big challenge we're facing is that we need to realize emission savings in the building sector worth 50 million tons of CO2 by 2030. And that's according to our very own Climate Act. So huge challenge there. And to get there, and you will all notice, uh, we have to think about two, two things in parallel. We need to um, think about the retrofitting measures so heat does not get lost by the walls, windows, and roofs of a building. But you also need to replace fossil fuel-based heating sources with renewables, ideally a heat pump, because renewable energy is scarce and therefore valuable. Retrofitting makes even more sense. Now, what's the German government doing? First of all, since 2006, KFW has been the government's vehicle of choice for financing both energy efficiency measures in uh, new buildings, but also retrofitting measures. KFW is a government-owned uh, public bank. It's nevertheless fully regulated, and it works through intermediaries. In other words, through commercial banks who decide on whether a loan gets handed out or not. The loans are subsidized, and they're usually combined with grant elements. So that's the machinery. But I can't emphasize enough that loans are not very uh, attractive at the moment because interests are super low anyway, and the incentives in terms of energy savings are simply not enough these days. And this is why government grants are so important, be it for the retrofitting of an entire building or for individual measures such as uh, windows, uh, especially in case people live in a flat or a condo and have no or little influence over other parts of the building. And obviously, grants can still be combined uh, with a loan. People are usually encouraged, and this is really important, um, are usually encouraged to work with a certified energy efficiency advisor to come up with the best solution for the situation. And the grants I just mentioned cover a large part of the fees that uh, the advisor would charge. This year alone, and this is uh, special, the economics ministry is spending 8 billion euros on grants for energy efficiency measures. And what we hear from officials that, is that the uptake is simply great. And this is not surprising because the maximum support rate has been increased to 40%, 40% grant element for energy efficiency measures and 80% for the technical advice, so the um, energy efficiency advisor, uh, on which measures would be the most beneficial ones. The rule of thumb is the more ambitious your energy efficiency measures are, 
In other words, the more you go beyond what is legally required, the higher the support rate will be. Um, and the KFW energy efficiency standard, you might have heard of this, uh, gives very clear guidelines for this. Some other measures are less promising, especially from a climate point of view. As of this year, there are grants for the replacement of oil heatings of up to 45% of the retail price. But the trouble is that there are lots of loopholes in the grant program and hybrid solutions can get the same support as fully renewable heating systems. An additional mechanism to finance retrofitting measures was introduced this year. Germany now has made um, tax rebates possible, whereby homeowners can write off their energy efficiency investments from their taxable income. And such a tax rebate is certainly attractive uh, for affluent citizens with little time uh, for detail and a lot to gain in terms of tax savings. However, there will be very little quality control as people will only have to submit the builder's bill to their tax department. And it's not always clear whether the measure really um, is uh, the most effective one. So while well, there's huge demand on the enti entire range of government measures in new buildings, the same cannot be said for the existing housing stock. Only 0.1% of the German building stock is subject to a complete retrofitting every year. Um, the rest is just individual measures um, such as windows. And why is this? We can come back to this later. It's my last sentence. Well, what we lack until this day in Germany is an effective legal basis for retrofitting. Germany has not yet implemented the European Energy Efficiency Directive that was published two years ago. And uh, quite frankly, support measures alone will not get us where we need to be. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. That was a fantastic uh introduction to what's going on in Germany and it, it, it certainly leaves me feeling that we have a long distance to travel in this country. The levels of, of support that you're talking about are, are, are quite different here and also the, the cadre of technical advisors, energy efficiency advisors, um, I, I don't think exist at that same level here in Canada. But to get an introduction to that, I'm going to turn now to Brendan Haley, who's policy director at Efficiency Canada. Brendan, would you give us a, a, an equivalent tour of the recent history and current status of legislation and financing uh, and, and grants, et cetera, in this space in Canada? Sure. Um, so in Canada, North America, I mean, traditionally, over the past number of decades, the, the major way that efficiency has been supported is through energy utilities, crown corporations, or even efficiency utilities. And there is a program called EnerGuide, which does have energy auditors and, you know, provides um, those grants. I think maybe what's a bit different is, you know, the primary justification here is that energy savings are a lower cost alternative to say something like power plants. And that's a good argument, but it's also tended to support fairly shallow energy savings measures because you're really relying on those carbon reductions or energy savings as almost a co-benefit rather than, you know, a mission in itself. Um, certainly, I think in Canada also attempts to engage um, banks has been difficult, especially for smaller buildings or lower rent buildings. Um, you know, a common story is that banks see high trans transaction costs for individual projects, high perceived risks because they're, they're just unfamiliar with those types of investments. So just on the financing side, there's been some movement in the last uh, year or so. Um, the 2019 federal budget provided $1 billion in investment for a series of municipal initiatives. And this year, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities launched a community efficiency financing program. Um, so that is supporting residential retrofit plans. And they're typically financed through uh, utility bills or what's called property assessed clean energy or PACE financing which connects repayment to property tax bills. And just in the policy tracking we do, this is, I think, spurred some extra movement in the provinces. So for instance, in just the last couple of months, Saskatchewan has now enabled their municipalities to use this PACE financing. And I'm expecting, I'm hoping there'll be some forward movement in British Columbia and, and PEI. The other big news is that in September, the Canada Infrastructure Bank released a new growth plan and that included $2 billion for retrofits of large buildings. And that's a pretty big deal because the CIB was, did not previously consider efficient buildings really as part of infrastructure and considering our building stock as infrastructure, just like 
roads, bridges, and transmission lines, I think is, is the way we should be thinking about it. So we're perhaps starting to add, you know, some of the ingredients that Germany has to the Canadian policy mix with a, a national bank that can provide low cost, you know, patient capital that can hopefully move other in the market towards retrofits. But we also really need to find um, a way to connect that on the ground market knowledge, right, with that national level finance. And that could come from a variety of solution providers, including those municipal initiatives, those traditional program administrators, you know, or potentially the creation of regional green banks, which uh, we see happening in, in the United States. Thank you so much, Brendan. So there's clearly activity in the space, but I think it was striking that you said the federal government put a billion dollars on the table and Sabrina mentioned that there was 8 billion euros this year for grants um, in Germany, which is orders of magnitude different. And we are talking, you know, in order to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, we need to deal with this problem and we need uh, an, a continuing number of net zero homes uh, and we need that number to grow uh, steadily so let alone all the jobs opportunities that, that have been mentioned. Julia Langer, Julia is the CEO of the Atmospheric Fund and she's someone uh, who's been working in this space for a long time particularly in the multi-residential unit side of things so tell us Julia about your experience with this and also about how you see this question of federal provincial and city roles within the uh, energy efficiency um, space for buildings. Thanks, Diana. Um, and so I'll just I'll do a very 30,000 foot view about TAF. Um, uh, we're an organization that was created actually by the city of Toronto back in 1991 before climate change was headline news um, and have therefore helped the city get a bit of a jump on the climate agenda. Um, and now, um, so we're, we've been endowed by the city, uh, the province and the federal government. And so um, our, our focus has really been on urban carbon emissions. And of course, 50% of that is buildings. Uh, so it's, it's less than that on a national scale because of we have a lot of industry, we have transportation, et cetera, but, but buildings are, are the biggest source of emissions in cities. And so uh, a huge opportunity for meeting our climate targets. Many cities have declared climate emergencies. And so we have to get on with this with alacrity, as you said. And so we certainly see things from the perspective of all hands on deck. And so it's not just government. So obviously um, the federal government has a regulatory role in terms of equipment standards and grants and, and programs like Energide where, where we have had in the past uh, actual grants for uh, energy efficiency, don't really actually have that now, certainly not for single family buildings. And there is kind of a, maybe a pendulum happening in terms of financing versus grants, but I think both are still needed. Uh, so let's not throw babies out with bathwater. Uh, provincial government, clearly a strong uh, role in terms of codes and standards, in terms of uh, uh, on the ground programming for different sectors. Um, but let's not forget the municipalities. They, they have certainly tools in terms of um, zoning Toronto green standard, which is the city of Toronto's own approach to energy efficiency for new construction and Whitby, uh, shout out to Whitby, which has now passed a, a green standard as well. Um, and so, so we need to actually have that interplay between the cities and the provinces and the federal government. But let's not forget asset owners, building owners are a big part of the, the mix here. Um, and, and it's their buildings and it's the people who live in those buildings uh, and who work and play in those buildings that need to be engaged in the solutions and who face some of the challenges um, as well as the investors. And I know we'll get uh, a bit into that in more detail. And the, the reality is that we do face a lot of challenges. Like we, we have a lot of intel and experience um, and what this needs to do is is bring it home in terms of what those roles and responsibilities need to be going forward and some of the challenges that um, I guess I'll, I'll do a bit of a setup for for some of the the conversation here but if I can boil it down to four we have a very 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 low energy prices in in it's global but uh, Canada-wide 
and which means that retrofits and efficiency has not been a priority especially right now as with gas being so very very cheap it's hard to make a business case for deep uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions but it's not impossible so we just have to work with what we have the building sector is super disaggregated there are zillions and zillions of buildings think about it all across the country of different types and so getting scale is key to advancing this agenda and so we have to address head-on how we aggregate this disaggregated sector thirdly the business case for retrofits and for net zero new construction is positive there is an roi it's it is also disaggregated some people you know get the benefit and some people don't there's also unmonetized benefits uh, like the environmental and the social benefits and we need to find a way to bring those together and make it make it really work for everybody and it is totally possible and then i guess another piece and this is brendan sort of you know when we start talking about this it is complicated it's not that this is simple or it would be happening it's off the shelf technology we are not lacking for technology but but it's complicated to put together a multi-measure deep retrofit on a building by building by building basis and making it more cookie cutter, making it more sort of the streamlined mainstreamed pathway to, to making those retrofits work and bringing that price down by reducing complexity is going to be a key. Um, and I think so many of the, the panelists here have such great uh, experience to offer to us in Canada. So really excited to bring that together. Thank you so much, Julia. I'm going to turn now, we've talked quite a bit about retrofits and just mentioned the new build issue. I'm going to turn now to, to that question. Uh, we have Andrea Del Zotto here from Developers um, Tridel. And you are wrestling, I know, and you have been thinking a lot about this and working with Julia's organization to think how you can build better in the first place. Um, perhaps you could tell us how you think about building sustainability at Tridel and, and how you've overcome some of the, the, the challenges around keeping the cost at a level that enables your condos to be uh, competitive out there in the market and any innovations that, that are coming down the line in, uh, in the new build sector. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Diana. Uh, my first comment was going to be there's an awful lot of dialogue about the retrofit and as one of the largest builders in the GTA and high rise, we want to build it right the first time, but it's not so simple. They don't make it, they certainly don't make it easy. You referenced our relationship with Julia. So in 2008, I believe we, we co-created the first green loan with Toronto Atmospheric Fund, where we, we created two sister buildings and we could definitely see um, very clearly the benefits of creating, creating a lead silver building with 40% in reduction in energy use. So I mean, that was easy and it worked. And we have challenges. You also talked about the owners of these buildings. In the majority of our case, the owners of the buildings are the residents and the condo corporations. And there's a different mentality when it comes to them, them kind of taking over the cost of the green loan and it, the inception coming with the home builder. There's a bit of a mixed sentiment about that. So we have to get over that, whether it's educating the board members, making them more, having, giving them a skill set that they're lacking, the ability to demonstrate the long-term advantages of delivering a building such as that. So we definitely had an early appetite. Um, and then we saw the industry level up. We had um, Toronto Green Standards evolving, a Canadian Green, uh, Green Building Council lead. We have the Net Z um, um, targets that we're aiming for, which are all really ambitious, but really necessary. Um, and we've also done LEED certified neighborhoods and our first platinum building down at the waterfront. So definitely we have an appetite for it, despite the challenges. Um, with that, we did a net Z suite at one of our waterfront communities. And when you just think of the logistical constraints, it took the entire rooftop <laughs> for one suite. So, so we're looking at solutions. Um, we're looking at something called Cladify, where we can put... Um, uh, PV panels on the sides of the building to try to create almost a district energy system. Um, that's one solution. We've looked at things such as modular 
which are still in their infancy. And for us, it was still challenging with some of the, um, the constraints, whether it be with the unions or the logistics of the schedule of the building. Um, and we're also really starting to look at the materials that we're building with that, you know, we're so focused on the operational performance of the buildings. But really, if we're starting with building it right from the first time, we have to look at those materials. We partnered with uh, Department of Engineering at U of T to help um, professor there create one of the world's largest uh, data banks of embodied carbon. And because there's no transparency uh, or record keeping really about that. So how do we make it better without understanding what we have and where it's spent when it comes to concrete and steel? So we're, you know, I think projects like that, looking at innovation and sustainability in ways that are forward thinking, that can help us learn from the past are really, really critical. And then, you know, just challenges, again, someone mentioned the financial model. There's really uh, no mechanism for, for developers to, you know, to get back the capital that they're putting in to make these buildings work better and build better. And there's also got to be, you know, last note, a change in the attitude. You know, today, everybody goes to a construction site and assembles all the pieces of it. So I was listening to, to someone talk about the changes in the curriculum in our education institutions. And they said, we almost need a shift from not thinking what are the best qualifications for the job I want, but what are the best qualifications for the world that we want? And I think if we adapt that type of thinking to construction and building, um, we're gonna get there a lot faster with all, of, you know, with all these participants by being creative um, and by having government technology, all of that on our side working towards shared goals. Thank you. It's complex. I mean, this is what's coming through in, in what everyone's saying. There's obviously a huge role for uh, government regulation in this space. If they leveled the playing fields, for example, in the Netherlands, you're not allowed to build a new, con new build that is con uh, connected to the gas, natural gas grid anymore. It is, has been illegal for the past couple of years. I mean, that changes everything, right? If, if everyone is in the same space on that. So I think the, the, the payback to changes in, in building codes and regulation is huge. But there are also issues, and someone's referenced it, you know, that what people like to see in a new condo is not necessarily what is environmentally good. So all these glass walls and all these other things, which really have become the norm if you go to downtown Toronto, you know, that has to change. So it is about people's, people, you know, people's choices and, and how they view the product, which is after all the most important, uh, you know, expensive product that they are buying. So you talked about reconceptualizing uh, skills, and I think that's a perfect time to bring in Stephanie. So Stephanie Kerline is the project manager at, at IBA 27. She can explain what that is. Um, but you are advocating that we need to think about buildings in an entirely different way. Can you explain that uh, and, and, and tell us how that might contribute to solving these issues? Thanks a lot, Diana. Yeah, I would like to give you a short overview of our experimental format, the EBA. What will our lives, homes and work be like in the future? Um, 100 years after the opening of the Weisenhof estate in Stuttgart in 1927, this is the question to be addressed by the International Building Exhibition, which will be hosted in 2027 in the region of Stuttgart. So it's short named IBA. The IBA aims to provide examples to make the journey into the future visible and tangible through innovative building projects across the entire region. And as part of our work, we put people at the heart of the project using dialogue to come up with new answers to the question of how to accomplish the social, technological and ecological transition successfully. In general, international building exhibitions have been around for more than 100 years and are a German format. Along the history, they have, they have evolved from pure architecture exhibitions to far reaching laboratories of urban and regional development. And that's very important. With a wide range of different projects, they promote innovations in architecture and planning over a period of several years. So the IBAS um, connect the potential to be found in communities, in companies, in research and in politics in order to transform the future of cities and regions. They also provide a framework for experiments outside the scope of everyday planning by searching for courageous and new answers to the social, economic and ecological questions of the building sector. 
So what are we dealing with? Currently, we have more than 120 project submissions, um, a bunch of building projects, um, research projects and events. Uh, we are defining new innovative planning processes, organizing participation and expert dialogues to gain important information on the particular project issues and to implement them into the uh, upcoming planning competitions. In our projects, we create experiment, experimental areas um, to test and implement innovations of the building sector, like materials, techniques, and technologies. So our goal is to create awareness and promote a new state of mind away from our status quo regarding sustainability, new dwelling, and work forms. We connect people, ideas, companies, and towns in order to enable an open dialogue to design our regional transformation process. We try to thoroughly analyze the actual issues and to change the status quo through new creative measures with which certain regulations, formalities, and public financial support are not needed anymore. What does that mean? For example, isn't it much more efficient to think about changing our dwelling typologies and size um, instead of approving further financial programs to support the building of conventional dwelling forms? And if we will lead the building sector to circulation, then a lot of regulations won't be needed anymore. So we think this will be the new normal. We are dealing with both construction of new buildings and renovation of the existing ones with the co-work of our international expertise and network. In addition to this, the project executors and us try to bundle public supports um, for the realization, such as government funded urban renovation areas, retrofit programs um, of the KFW Bank, for example, and uh, also European programs like the current European Green Deal. To sum up, our main task is to rethink the processes that have been established and implemented in the last decades in Germany and to propose a new way of, think of thinking um, and developing urban and building projects. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, uh, you know, it, it is, I think we need step change. And I think that's great to hear what, what you're thinking in the space. We've had, we have lots and lots of comments and chat questions coming in. Uh, we also have masses of material to cover. I think, uh, let me focus down on what I'm hearing. One is, uh, you know, this is a massively dispersed sector. Uh, we all have our homes, um, but we also have commercial buildings, etc. It's one that we cannot get away with not decarbonizing if we're going to meet our targets. There's big financing issues. I think there's some interesting questions coming in about the assumption that this is an expensive process and that this is this is an increased cost. And that depends on the life, on the time frame that we're thinking about things for, because obviously the, the energy savings do come in. And there's been some very interesting work in the US, an organization called Rewiring America, that figures that in the very short term, Households by by insulating and changing to electric uh, sources of home heating can save in the order of one to two thousand dollars per year per household per average household in most states. Um, so it is. I think we need to get that payback period to be shorter. The other thing that's come up a, a, a few times in the chat is the issue of fuel poverty. And you know we can talk about uh, retrofitting households uh, for um, to, to save carbon. Um, but there is also an issue for those who are struggling to pay their bills now. If we can help them uh, get to an energy efficiency system, it is uh, an energy efficient house. It is win win because their bills go down. They can live more comfortably. But again, they're the people least likely to be able to put their own money on the table for this. So that is a part of the discussion, which we probably won't get into um, deeply today. Uh, but we have a housing stock, most of which is going to be with us in 2050. We've got people installing systems right now, heating systems that are going to last for 20 to 30 years. So we really need to make a change and we really need to get skills and jobs sorted. But let's get back to the financing piece. And I want to um, bring in two people here. Julia, just to explain why in detail this is such a challenge, in, particularly in the multi-units, uh, uh, multi-family units that you've been dealing with. And then I'm going to talk to Fred Betes from Canada Infrastructure Bank, who, as uh, Brennan referenced, is, is, taking, is playing a, an increasing role in this space. So I'll bring uh, Fred in to describe uh, what he uh, and his organization is doing. He's the Managing Director of Investments at the Canada Infrastructure Bank. So Julia, you first, thank you. 
so I guess let's let's maybe drill down to some of the solutions because a lot of the chat and I'm I'm sorry I'm 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 not my multitasking in terms of paying attention to the panel and the chat is not very good but please also uh, feel free to go to TAF's website where we do have a huge amount of literature uh, based on case studies that that TAF has implemented at projects we've implemented over many years that look at both the business case and financing and technical aspects of new construction through some of the work with Tridell and, and others in, in Toronto and on the retrofit side. And I think the part of the issue is the lack of um, specialized financial instruments to use that will help with investment and the business case for, for both the new construction and the retrofit side of things. And that will help bring together that, in, that address that, that complexity, address the split incentives and, and who needs what out of any particular deal. And so on the retrofit side, uh, we've developed a performance contract model, recognizing that a lot of the um, the building owners really they've done a lighting retrofit or they've done an HVAC replacement. But what we need to get to is the multi-measure retrofit, so to drive down emissions deeply and quickly. And so um, this is where we we provide up to 100% of the financing, um, but also layer in some of the utility incentives. If there were grants from government, then we could layer that in as well so that um, we actually get the kinds of returns on investment that each party needs. So a bank needs a commercial return on investment. A government doesn't need a return on investment. They, they do this as a, as a public service, as part of achieving our targets. And building owners, they regularly invest in their buildings, whether you're a homeowner or a, a, you know, a condo owner. Um, so, and so how can you layer in your regular capital investment? And, and I think that's part of the sense making that we need here is to know that we have the technology, we are not lacking for capital, we're not lacking for technology. What we're lacking for is systems and structure and recognizing the value proposition for each of the parties. And the, uh, you know, to the point, I don't think that we need, to, we can ignore the fact that affordability is an issue that some people have capital, some people do not, and that we need to tailor the programs that is relevant for each of those players, including in the low income space, including in our municipal and institutional buildings. So design the systems to work for each of those buildings and each of those parties. On the exist uh, on the new construction, as, as Andrea was mentioning, uh, there are also financial strategies uh, that will recognize the, you know, that the developer wants, needs to, they, they, they build and then they don't own. And it should be the owners that, who are the beneficiaries of a very well functioning and low cost operating building that should contribute and participate in that in some ways. Financial instruments can help with that. It's not about the technology. It's about making sure that each party gets the return and the objectives that they wish. Um, and then, but the drivers of this are absolutely critical. We need building codes, including for new construction and for uh, retrofits so that we, we make sure that it's an expectation. Um, and it's not just left to the leaders like Tridel. Uh, we, we actually have to raise the floor you know, and set the pace for everybody. And I think that's, that's part of the equation that we, we might be missing here, that, that it's like setting the agenda so that we can bring together those tools and, and objectives uh, to, to the common cause. Thank you, Julia. Um, Fred, what are you doing in the space. Uh, thanks, Diana. So what we are doing is uh, there's a lot of similarities between what the CIB is trying to do and what the, the TAF is doing, uh, but there's a few differences too. As uh, Now, as a bank, our focus is, as you might imagine, on the financial aspect of, uh, of, the, of the issue here. The bank has a mandate to look at financing retrofits, so we don't look at new bills. Um, we, we are not yet, or maybe never will be in the uh, real estate business. We are in the infrastructure business, and so we've identified retrofits as a portion of the energy infrastructure to, to be addressed. 
Uh, as a bank, we uh, certainly do recognize that the issues are not all, all financing related. Uh, some of them may be workforce and training related, education related. Some of them are uh, policy driven, regulation driven, um, but there are some that are driven by financing. On the financing aspect, we also recognize there's uh, different needs. Uh, one is the upfront costs of energy audits, uh, feasibility studies, design, and, and even just marketing and educating the market, which on that front, we're working with uh, other organizations to see how much of that we could finance, but how much of that could we also work together so that we both market our initiatives and, and then educate the market to get ready and to seek financing from the CIB or others. At the back end of that, there's the issue of grants or subsidies for deeper retrofits where the investments might not ever return um, capital or might not return all the capital. So the bank tries to play the role somewhere in between where we will provide long-term, low-cost financing to deep retrofits, uh, deep being a definition that we're still finalizing. Uh, we are targeting both the public and the private sector uh, but uh, primarily focusing on industrial and commercial and, and institutional uh, sectors, not as much on the residential side. Uh, the bank has a uh, $35 billion uh, allocation, $2 billion recently allocated to retrofits, and, and we've, we've, we've been asked to deploy capital in, in larger projects. Now, what does that mean? That means not necessarily larger buildings. It could also mean smaller buildings, but into bundles of projects. So we do, as, as, as TAF also and others, we do work in um, developing an aggregation market or, or work with other entities who can create these portfolios. That could be as much on the public sector side uh, through cities and, 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 and provincial governments that manage large portfolios. It could be on the private side with investors, uh, consultants, and contractors who may be interested in, in aggregating different clients. Uh, it could be on the corporate side also, corporates or associations and we're uh, talking to utilities and municipalities also to see if we can be a backstop to PACE programs or on-bill on -bill, uh, financing. So, so the CIB, again, is, is a financing vehicle. It's a financing institution. We can't resolve all the policy aspect of it. But what we are trying to do is provide that financial backstop or that financial source that can at least alleviate that hurdle so that people can focus on the others. Now. How do we do that? I mean, and why do we do it? The, there's a few objectives. The first one is to go deeper. So if we can offer longer term, cheaper uh, financing, then hopefully people can go, not hopefully, but people will be able to go into deeper uh, retrofits because the economics will now make sense. Uh, but we're also looking at taking some of the risks that the, the financial sectors might not have taken before. So we do want to be a market maker in that sector where we will go in, we will cover our own transaction costs, we will aggregate projects. We will take on the risk associated with energy savings to pay back the investments. And then after that, we do want to go back to the private market and syndicate or securitize our loans. And I've seen comments here, I was trying to keep track of all the Q and A's. Um, you know, it could be through the issue of a green bond. It could be through syndication to commercial banks. It could be other, other different tools that we could use at that time. Um, you know, ultimately, if we can go deeper and make a market, and if I can work myself out of a job where the market then adopts these methods do, there, and where there is a standardization, where there is a, a new comfort level with the risk profile of these projects, and in five years, if the Canadian market, the, the banks and the investment funds decide that they don't need us anymore, well, I've done my job. Uh, but at this point, uh, we, don't, <laughs> we don't think that's an immediate uh, objective. Um, but that's what we're doing now. So the, the program, so we are already talking to the industry and to potential developers and owners. We will be uh, publishing um, uh, documentation on, on the details of the program early next year, also for people who, who want to have more information. But we're already deep into market sounding and the development of the program. And uh, hopefully we can play a role uh, across Canada uh, in the retrofit uh, the sector. And we are uh, very interested in, in working with other federal and provincial departments also where our opinion views or ideas may be used in, in changing policies or, or influencing policies if needed. Thank you. Um, it's been pointed out in the chat that it, one place that would be nice to start would be if all government buildings 
were yeah. exemplars of uh, the green uh, possibilities for, for commercial um, you know, non-residential units. Sabrina, let's come back to you in Germany. You're, you're a kind of veteran in this space and you've, you, you, you've focused on the financing. From what you're hearing about what's going on in Canada, what are your reflections? I mean, you mentioned grants as opposed to fine, you know, loans and, and we're mostly doing loans if we're doing anything at all. How, how do you think we're doing? Well, actually, what I'd recommend you to do um, is to watch the European space, not just to look at Germany, because if you need inspiration from elsewhere, you might also want to look, well, Diana, you mentioned the Netherlands, um, for instance, uh, but also France is a great example, the UK, even though it's leaving the EU. So I recommend you do that. Um, and the European space is important because the European Commission is, um, has just launched um, a program called the Renovation Wave. And this will make it mandatory for member states to raise both the ambition and, of course, the implementation rate um, of um, energy efficiency measures. So I can only um, recommend that uh, you, you follow this a bit more closely. Now, another important piece of information, I guess, is that the German housing lobby and the Federal Industry Association are nowadays arguing in favor of energy efficiency policies that are no longer optional, but mandatory. So we need regulation. There is truly emerging consensus in this country that we need a combination of regulation, financial support, subsidized expert advice, and helpful guidelines. And all of this um, to really save the 50 million tons of CO2 by 2030 that I mentioned before. Uh, because this is the government's goal after all. Now, an important approach that's being taken in Germany now, at least uh, in a conceptual way, is um, that we know we need to switch our heating systems to electric heat pumps um, based on renewable energy. But we also need to bring down on our, our energy consumption in buildings significant, significantly at the same time. And only these two measures in peril will get us who we need and where we want to be. This will require 600,000 new heat pumps per year. Right now, we're adding less than 100,000 per year. And all of this is in new buildings, not even in the existing housing stock. Another challenge is in this context, we will need to develop integrated retrofitting plans for buildings. So not just individual measures. And of course, for an entire neighborhood to identify the full potential of uh, the uh, existing energy efficiency measures. So all of this is um, the homework we'll st we still have to do. And um, I guess that some of this uh, will apply to Germany as well. One very last um, piece of information or advice, however you want to take it. Right now, there is uh, quite a bit of talk in Germany about replacing coal as a heating source by gas or even hydrogen. And obviously, the problem with gas is that it will only create renewed fossil lock-in. And uh, this is something we need to avoid under all circumstances at the very least in Germany. And when it comes to hydrogen, the new magic potion, potion um, to save the climate, it would make even less sense to waste it um, for heating because it will remain an expensive resource and we will need it desperately to decarbonize heavy industry. So this is the homework we still need to do. And I think it's also some of some, a little bit of shared homework. Absolutely, uh, I couldn't agree more. Over to you again, Andrea. I've got several questions um, about just, just sort of the basics of how much more it really costs you per unit if you're going to do the lead silver, for example, perhaps lead gold, platinum. And just some reflections on what you have heard um, about this combination of incense, you know, carrot and stick approach for new buildings. And just the last thing I want to throw in is, is how COVID has affected your business i know kind of homes in general have been a growth area but you know potentially we're seeing stranded assets in the in the office space that could be turned into residential units and stuff like that has that altered the way you think about the future of building sure um i will i will start with the cost so i did get some numbers on that to to construct a lead gold building is about a premium of about one percent and to do the latest Toronto Green Standard version three tier two is closer to four to six percent premium on construction costs. So, you know, I see I'm not also not great at multitasking, but I see in the chat, you know, the focus on why does it have to be so expensive? Uh, maybe in the in the bigger scheme of things, there's so many competing costs in the environment. So for developers, so we have the development charges, 
that go to the government that are just escalating always, right? Always paying more in development charges and levies. We also have the maintenance fees in a condominium context where those are escalating as well to a point that it's, it could reach 90, 90 cents per square foot. So I think, I think maybe related to COVID as well is looking at how those, what, what is, you know, what's, what are those comprised of those maintenance fees and how are we using the space we have? Because many times I think you have some amenity spaces that are sitting idle. And I think that kind of paired with the pay per use mentality that we're seeing is we can come up with a new model as to how the space is being utilized and have, having it be more efficient. Um, I also talked about, I think the other area COVID has, has impacted us is, you know, you, when you have an asset manager that owns the building, naturally you can recover the cost because people are paying more in rent. You can, you can have that absorbed in your, in your rent from your tenants. But when, what the problem was, not, you know, the champagne problem is you had a lot of investors in our market where they did not, they did not pay attention to that. But now that you, one of the COVID outcomes I think is you're having a lot more end users in these, in these condominium suites. And they are, they are conscious of the cost they're paying for the utilities. So I think they do have more um, care and attention towards things being built in a sustainable fashion. The green loans I talked about, um, the resistance, I think there's a lot of work we can do with the utility companies. There's um, green, green bonds that we're seeing more and more. And we're, we're currently investigating a green loan through the city's municipal bonds that would allow us to work on our private assets. So for example, over a 20 year period in around the 2% range for PV installations on our buildings that would put the condo in a cash flow positive position from day one. So that's kind of hard to say no to if you're a condo corporation. So looking at things like that, um, similar, and you know, it could be recovered through property taxes, just like the PACE program that Brendan was talking about, because that doesn't exist for multi, multi-unit dwellings. That's more for single family. The other thing with the there's a lot of, I'd say, some anxiety around the Toronto Green Standard version three, because how do we incorporate that into our construction costs? Because everything tends to get trickled down to the home buyer. They're already, we already have an affordability problem. So can we use those things, you know, as a negotiation? So when it comes to allow for more density, as long as you provide this level of energy consumption in your building, like let's come up with some new math rather than what, what status quo is. Back to the utility companies, I would just say, instead of uh, the utilities upsizing their infrastructure in terms of water mains, sewage lines, gas, et cetera, they can offer incentives for the developers perhaps to finance more energy efficient upgrades in their building instead of them upgrading what they've got for their own infrastructure. For example, then when it comes to the management of these private public assets as developers were mandated to put in high storm water, high storm water water tanks and they're always at capacity so you you know the technology side invest in something that's monitoring and can can drain these tanks in the event we have one of these other you know 100 year storms because right now they're not being managed properly so those are things that um, the utility companies can perhaps help with green upgrades i know i was asked to talk about really uh, it's it's incorporated in our building with our lead certification. We've also gone above and beyond with Fitwell to tie it into the behavioral side of how people live and not just where they live. Is it perfect? No, because people can upgrade their finishes in their home, um, which may not always be the greenest. But I think, again, getting to the point where we look at the materials through things like embodied carbon and construction materials calculations will bring awareness to that. And um yeah, I think like Julia said, it would be nice if we had a standard so we can share the heavy load and uh, yeah, then we're, we have an equal playing field. Thank you so much. I think we, we've got a lot of comments in the chat uh, and I think there was some surprise that the, the uplift costs for going green really aren't that high. Um, uh, even passive houses, 10 to 15% uh, is the suggestion in the chat. So these should be things that we can manage. We're running out of time. I want to go very quickly to Brendan and just ask you about the skills piece, Brendan. Do you think we have the skills in the economy here in Canada to do this at the scale we need to right now? And how can we address that very quickly? Well, I think what everyone's talking about is really innovation of building business models that we need, right? Like all the pieces that come together to develop a retrofit solution, we need to streamline that, have it become more industrial. We need a policy approach that recognizes the need to facilitate new relationships in the market. So for instance, in the Netherlands, 
they've had these market development teams, they aggregate large demand and then go to manufacturers and say, we need you to meet this standard. But the other aspect of skills is just the people to do the work. And that is an issue. There is a looming labor shortage in the trades that we really need to deal with. And I think that can be managed by showing this is a long-term career. There's lots of demand and marketing, you know, building renewal as part of the climate emergency, part of promoting health and social justice, you know, in your community. And that I think hopefully will help us reach, you know, a new generation of workers that we need to come into the trades. We need to have the right people in place and we need to make this easy. I mean, there's lots of pieces to come together, but we've heard we need to aggregate. We need to make it easy for the homeowner, for the building owner, for the building uh, creator. Uh, and it, that shouldn't be beyond the wit of us, I hope. But Stephanie, last word to you before I uh, say my thanks. How do we kind of get public buy-in of the type that Brendan was talking about to, to think about, you know, this as our future? Yeah, through our formats, we connect many different stakeholders from citizens to public and private institutions and initiate new discussions um, and open dialogues. So this is the way to raise awareness of the built environment and to enhance the willingness to try new things. We have often experienced that it helps a lot to show them best practice examples from all over the world and how parts and ideas of them could be implemented in our projects. Um, the most important point is to involve the named stakeholders from the beginning in the whole planning process and to make it as transparent and communicative as possible. You have to give them the chance to participate, to be taken seriously, and to show them how their thoughts and comments will be considered in the following process. So, therefore, another special participation format um, of our EBA um, our, our 20 open working groups made up from normal citizens and professionals. They bring their own experience and backgrounds and work together on a specific topic during the free time uh, in order to support our project developments. So we can say our mission is to create new visible accessible examples which can have a broad impact. It's not about reinventing the world. It's more about having the courage to leave the comfort zone, be creative and even brave to try new things and ways of doing. So for sure, some of our ideas and projects will fail, but this is the way innovations are being generated. I think that was a, a fantastic and kind of rousing end to this. We do really need to think differently uh, and rise to this challenge. It is, it is doable um, for sure. This is not such a stretch as some of the carbon capture technologies, for example, and we're, we are wasting carbon in the building space dreadfully. We're going to need to, to, to stop emitting and we're also going to have to snatch that carbon back from the atmosphere and that's going to be very expensive. So let's stop it getting there in the first place. Um, I'm going to bring this uh, series, not just this event, uh, this series to a close. Um, I would like to thank all the panelists who've been with us today. It was a great discussion. We could have gone on for a long time. I'd like to thank the participants to this and the other events that we've hosted. And I would like particularly to thank the German Embassy in Canada for uh, connecting us with such great panelists from Germany and for uh, supporting our work in this area. So let me just pass over to uh, Ambassador Sparwasser for a final word. Thank you so much, Diana. I think we've closed the series on a very high note. The Build Back Better Together um, with the retrofitting was very beautifully expressed. And we've covered a lot of other ground in the whole series from hydrogen to carbon to fiber to the whole financing issue. I want to say a big thank you to Toby Heaps, to his team at Corporate Knights for having established a fabulous series. I want to say a big thank you to you, Diana, for leading us through so much material with passion and, and so savvy. And um, I just want to close by saying there's lots of potential, as we've seen, for working together between Germany and Canada in the interest of our prosperity, of our competitivity, and our net zero future, which is a priority for both of us. So um, a series to be continued and, uh, and um, concluding in the hope that next year everything is getting better. Thank you so much. So, Toby, I'm going to leave you to finish and also suggest that although this is the last in this series, you'll, you'll tell people what they can tune into coming up from Corporate Nights uh, in a related area. 
So over to you for the final word, Toby. Sure. Um, uh, thanks, Diana. It's been a real pleasure uh, tuning in and, and, um, and, uh, and having you um, guide us uh, through these uh, 10 weeks and five sessions. And, and Ambassador, um, also uh, a, such a great pleasure to work with you and your team and uh, your European colleagues. Um, and everyone who's participated, many of you have come to uh, multiple sessions. Thank you um, for uh, putting your time and energy and comments and insights. Uh, we've really appreciated them. I think if we reflect on what we have learned in the last 10 weeks, five uh, sessions, the two things that stand out most clearly for me are, one is the, the magnitude of the opportunity, the absolute size of the opportunity and the way that the sands are shifting towards a more climate smart, people friendly economy. We looked across multiple levels from the policies that are happening to the money that is flowing on the atomic level in terms of the carbon fiber level, uh, opportunity, on the molecular level in terms of the, the hydrogen opportunity, and on that foundation, that rock uh, of our homes and workplaces where we live and work and how we can make them more comfortable and, and uh, more economical to run. We looked all, all across these areas and the common denominator was all of these areas are moving to be more climate smart and more people friendly. So this, this is where the, the puck is going. We have a massive opportunity to go pursue it. A Canada right now um, and Europe uh, to solve these uh, issues, uh, we are going to need to uh, fix the angel. The angel is in the detail and we're gonna to need to solve those details working together um, is the great, great, great friendship that we have is, is our is in our history and our common values. There's a tremendous opportunity here. Right now, we have 10% of our trade going to Europe from Canada. We have a goal as a country to increase our overseas exports, total overseas exports by 50% by 2025. Europe is a great partner. It's, there's an ocean that separates us, but that distance is small in comparison to the values and, and our common resolve to nurture an economy that works better for people on the planet. So as we emerge from the second wave and get ready to build back better, um, look forward to building back better together with Europe and, and, and thanks everyone for participating. Um, coming up in just a, shoot, a few short weeks on December 9th, we'll be hosting a significant event with uh, Margaret Atwood and David Suzuki, Sheila Watt-Puche and Michael Sabia from the Canadian Infrastructure Bank to really bring a much broader group of Canadians um, into this tent and inspire them for the the size of the opportunity that is in front of us so that we can get moving and seize this moment that uh, confronts us uh, uh, as we emerge from the COVID crisis. So thank you again and um, have a wonderful day, wonderful week, and we look forward to moving this forward together.